you have your Bibles, I want to invite you. We're going to find ourselves in Mark chapter 10 this morning. Mark chapter 10, specifically in verses 32 through 45. Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45. Thank you so much for being here. I know uh, Pastor Hayden has already given you official welcome, and I just want to say we don't take it for granted that you're here. I just want you to know, if you're here this morning, you were uh, expected to be here. (laughs) You were prayed for to be here, that you would hear the word of God this morning. That you would see Christ high and lifted up. I want to encourage you that when you ready yourself for church on Saturday night and for Sunday morning. And I know of those who have little kids, it may be hard to ready yourself in any form, shape, or fashion, mentally or spiritually. (laughs) But when you come into God's house, I want to encourage you to expect to encounter a risen king who loves you. Expect to encounter Jesus who has conquered death on your behalf. Expect to hear the gospel message. Expect to leave changed to look more like him. Those are good things to expect. You say, why should I expect those things? Because God loves you and he desires this for you. And so we're so glad you're here. And our takeaway, our big idea, every week we want to give you a big idea for the message. And it would be this out of Mark chapter 10. It's Jesus is the model servant who ransoms sinners from hell. Jesus is the model servant who ransoms sinners from hell. We're going to break that down. You're going to see that all through this sermon. But if we're going to be disciples, and if Jesus is our model, if he's the servant, then we need to follow his model of humble servant leadership. One of the things that bothers me in the pastoral world, I've talked to pastors for 20 years now, and it seems to me that uh, sometimes them and church members uh, do this as well, but I see this among pastors, is that they think time in the ministry graduates them from levels of service. Well, let me, let me tell you something. Time in the ministry does not graduate us from levels of service. It doesn't matter if you've been in a ministry 50 years, you can still move a chair. You can still vacuum a carpet. You can still pick up some trash if you see it on the floor. One of the things I love about the late, great Charles Stanley, uh, pa- pastor of First Baptist in Atlanta for many, many, many years, is even in his senior stage of life, every, he would take two weeks every year and go into their church's warehouse and just put on overalls and go to work for two weeks. In, in the warehouse. He, why would he do that? Because he wanted to model for his people what a servant is, what a servant does. You, you never graduate from being a servant. And the reason we never graduate from being a servant is our chief servant, our Savior, the, the one who died for us. He, we're going to see in this passage, and we see all throughout Scripture, he left the throne of heaven. Now, I want you to think about this. Most of us think about graduating and promoting up to a thing. None of us want to be demoted, but Jesus came and demoted himself to be a servant. Went from king on the throne to thief, to sinner, to murderer, to liar, to prideful, to selfish on a cross. You say, how was Jesus all those things? How did he go from that to that? Because he took all of our sin upon himself when he came upon the cross. And he served us. So maybe you're here this morning and maybe you have a few questions that that God needs you to answer in your life. Number one, the number one question you need to answer in your life is, have I let Jesus pay the ransom for my sin? Have I accepted that payment? Jesus died for you. That you may know forgiveness. That you may have your sin taken away. Have you experienced that freedom? And the second question Jesus has for you this morning, if you say yes to that question, is this. Am I still serving after the model of his service? We're going to look at that this morning. Let's dive into our text this morning. Look at, starting in verse 32. We'll read the whole passage and we'll walk back through it. So Pastor Hayden, if you remember last week, he discusses, Jesus has this conversation uh, about the faith of a child and then this, this rich young ruler guy and he does some contrast into that. And so now they're continuing. We're, we're immediately upon Jerusalem. The triumphal entry, the, the cross is just days away from this conversation. You understand? Verse 32. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. 
And again he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism of with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or my left is not mine to give, but it is for those who it has been prepared. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Father God, would you soften our hearts this morning? Spirit, would you open our minds to the truth of your word? This text is an overwhelming text, Lord, of the weight of your obedience and of what you expect of those who follow you and who call upon you. It's an overwhelming weight, Lord, of the sacrifice that you willingly made on our behalf. May we not take that lightly this morning. And may we hear and respond accordingly. For our good and your glory. Amen. So the first thing I want you to see this morning is this. That Jesus demonstrates the perfect obedience that God desires. Jesus demonstrates the perfect obedience that God desires. Most of the times you and I, we want to be obedient. And we look, well, what does obedient look like? How do I become obedient? Well, one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is you may be a person who asks those questions. How do I figure out what God wants for my life? What am I supposed to be doing? The bigger question is this, how does God want me to be obedient? That's the question. Too often we ask the wrong question, where does God want my life to go? That's not the main question we are to be asking. The main question we are to be asking, how does my life honor the Lord? How do I obey His word? What does it look like to serve Christ faithfully? And the answer is to look to the Gospels. Jesus shows you and I perfectly what it means to be obedient. So this is what we would call the third prediction of His death. One, two, three. He's already made two. And each time, he's given a little more information and a little more information. But this time, he fills out the picture completely for the apostles to let them know exactly what was going on, exactly what he was going to be experiencing. you got to think about it. They're already on the way. They're walking to Jerusalem right now. They're days away from entering. The triumphal entry is going to come, and Jesus is, is, is going to enter, and there's palm branches, there's Hosanna, there's Son of David there. It's going to be amazing. But notice what Jesus does. He fills out the picture completely, and he does not waver from his task. Look at our text this morning. Look at verse 33. That's what he tells them. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. He told them exactly where he was going to go. So he had been telling them what was going to happen. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be killed. He was going to rise again. But, you know, that's kind of some abstract language. It's specific. But until you put a place and time on something, it's not really going to happen, right? Husbands, you know this, right? Hey, sweetheart, where do you want to go to eat? I don't know. When do you want to go? I don't know. It's never going to happen, right? Until you choose the wrong place, then she'll tell you the right place. Right? It's the way it works. So Jesus was making something very concrete. And this was something the disciples, listen to this. I want you to hear this. They could not get away from. It, they, were not, they were not going to Capernaum right now. They were not going to Judah right now. 
They were going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits on a high point in the area. They, they, they were walking up. They, they could see the city on a hill, right? So when Jesus says, I'm, we're going to Jerusalem, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem, there's some things that are going to happen there. It was very real. Jesus was, was winding the clock down, if you will, on his impending death and doom. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem. Listen to what he says. He describes perfectly what the psalmist and what the prophets foretold hundreds of years before. He says, this is going to happen of me. He uses this language, son of man. That may be confusing to you and I, but it wouldn't be confusing if you were a Jew. Because the son of man, if you were to read the Old Testament, it was this picture of the person who was going to come and, and, and bring God's kingdom here on earth. It was the picture of the Messiah. So he uses this in, in, in relation to himself. He says, I am the foretold one in the Old Testament. I have come and I'm going to Jerusalem to accomplish that which God has for me. But the disciples, even after the first prediction, even after the second prediction, they're not going to get it yet. We're going to see that in just a minute. But listen to what he says. He says he's going to be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. He's going to be handed over to them. Well, we got to ask the question, if Jesus is the king of the world, if he created all things, and, he, and, and by him, Colossians tells us, he holds all things together, who is handing over the king of creation? Who's doing that? He's willingly handing himself over. You remember, we're going to see this in a few weeks. In the garden, as Jesus is praying, as he's sweating drops of blood, he finishes his prayer uh, the Roman guards come up. They bring a whole cohort up there to, to get him. Peter chops off one of the ears of one of the priest's uh, assistants. And, and Jesus says, don't do that. There's no need for that. And he says, who are you here to, to get? And they said, Jesus. And what does he do? He simply says, I am here. It's me. I am who you're looking for. I am the man. Here I am. He hands himself over. So I want you to... How many of us would willingly turn ourselves in to a false claim of a crime? How many of us would willingly turn ourselves in to a false claim of a crime and we know the person we did it is the person who hates us the most and is our enemy in the world? Would you be willing to do that? Jesus says, I'm going to go be delivered to those people. I'm going to be delivered to the ones, to the ones, and this is what's so interesting to me. Notice that what he says. He says, who's he going to be delivered to? The chief priests, the people who know the law, the people who represent the people to God. They are supposed to be, they perform this action that he is about to make null and void. They are the ones who bring the sacrificial lamb, and he's about to become the ultimate, eternal sacrificial lamb. He says, I'm going to go to the scribes, the people who write and copy the law. And they're so detailed when they copy the law. The scribes would copy the law. They were so detailed. If they made one mistake at the bottom of a scroll, let's say they had spent three hours writing the scroll. They made one mistake on one letter. They would burn the whole scroll and start over. That's how much they revered the word. But they didn't recognize the word when he stood in front of them. How many of us don't recognize the word when he stands in front of us? How many of us have the word, have the word of God at our disposal? Yet we don't treasure it and we don't value it. Jesus has been delivered into our lap. He's been delivered onto our phones, onto our iPads to show us who he is. And yet we, most of us, if we're going to be honest, treat him as casually as we treat somebody holding the door for us, going in Applebee's or Chili's, whatever you want. He says, I'm going to be delivered. And what's going to happen? Are they going to, when he gets delivered, are they going to throw him a party? Say, Jesus, we're so thankful you're here. What does he say? He says, no. He says, and guess what they will do to me? They will condemn him. Well, they say, Jesus, you did a bad job. You're a bad boy. You're going to be grounded for two weeks. No, that's not what Jesus says they're going to do, is it? Look at the text. They're going to condemn him to death. And they're going to hand him over to the Gentiles. Jesus knowingly and willingly is the servant leader that went to death for you 
and die. Jesus willingly died for you. And what is so beautifully amazing about this and miraculous about this to me is this is not a snap decision where sometimes you and I will make a decision in a moment and it'll be the right decision. You're, you're come upon you with a lot of information at one time and you just you, you make a decision and it happens to be the right decision. That's not what happens with Jesus. This had been planned from eternity past that Jesus would come die for you and I. But it's different. You and I, we've had good intentions, haven't you? You've made plans to do good things. You've made plans to give your money in a certain way sometimes. You've made plans to go serve somebody before. You've made plans to go step up and do something of a generous nature, to be hospitable in a certain way, to be a servant in a certain way. You've made these detailed plans before. And then, and sometimes this is what happens in church, you'll be convicted. The Spirit will convict you right here today. And you'll say, God, I need to get that right. But you walk out of this door and you never think of the conviction again. Is that what Jesus models for us? No, he takes this plan, this what has been in his heart for all eternity. And when the moment arrives, he doesn't forget about it. He says, I've got a good thing going here. I don't want to leave it. These 12 guys are too dumb for me to leave with them alone. I've got to stay with them a little longer. That's not what he says. He says, the moment is here. The hour has come. We're upon the doorstep of an eternal moment. I'm going to go through it, and it's going to mean my death. For you. Beloved, that's what it means to be obedient. Follow through with the conviction of the Spirit. One of my prayers that I pray for myself, one of the prayers I pray for our church, is that the Spirit of God would convict us when the Word of God is preached. And that conviction would not stay in this room, but it would follow us into our homes. And our lives will be changed because of it. And if death wasn't enough, look what Jesus says in verse 34. He gets real specific. They're going to mock him. They're going to dress him up in a crown of thorns. They're going to put a scepter in his hand. They're going to put a borrowed robe of royalty on him. They're going to slap him and beat him and kick him and spit upon him. And then they're going to kneel down in mockery and say, oh, king. Not knowing he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus demonstrates the perfect obedience God desires. And he models for you and I what obedience looks like. So when God puts a word in your heart, when he puts a conviction in your heart, when he tells you something to do, when the Spirit of God comes into you and you know that's God talking to you, don't rush it off. Follow through with it. You say, well, it may cost me. I guarantee you it will cost me. If obedience is not costly, it's rarely obedience. Jesus demonstrates this cost of obedience. And you say, why would I be that obedient to the point it would cost me something? Because when you and I are obedient to the will of God in our life, God not only changes us, but he uses our obedience to show others the glory and the grace, the beauty and the majesty of Jesus Christ. That's what your obedience does. That's what your sacrifice does. When you model Jesus' perfect obedience. That's the first thing we see. The second thing we see in this passage is this. A Christian never graduates from being a servant. When I was working uh, as a chaplain years and years ago, and I was the chaplain supervisor of the prison, I had another chaplain working with me, and he had an a, a MDiv, and I tell you that because it's important to the story. And he had got a request from one of the wardens that he needed to justify some stuff that he wanted to purchase for our department. Now, we had a big department. We were the chaplain's department, the largest prison in America. We had 6,000 inmates. I had 1,000 volunteers coming every month. I had over 800 services. We, we used a lot of resources to make this thing happen. But this one warden, he was a persnickety guy, and so he was always making sure the budget was right. We weren't going over things. And, and he, he sent this request in to this other chaplain, and, and this guy was sitting at his desk with him, and, and he looked at this, and he began to read over this, and he balled this piece of paper up that he was supposed to be filling out, and he says, does he not know I have a master's degree? And threw it 
And I just sat there for a minute, and I said, what? I just asked him plainly. I, I, I'm, sometimes I don't know that I'm not supposed to ask questions, right? And I simply I said, hey, what does one thing have to do with the other? Did, did, does that degree keep you from doing your job? I thought it was supposed to enable you to do your job. And see, a lot of us, here's the thing. A lot of us think that our experiences throughout the years... Our maturity level throughout the years, our education throughout the years, and our financial growing in, 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 in security throughout the years, or our worldly position throughout the years, it limits us or it removes us from the menial tasks of Christian service. And you would say, well, I absolutely think that's true because it works at my job. I don't have to do the same stuff at my job that I, I did 20 years ago. The beautiful thing is the church doesn't care about that, does it? Jesus doesn't care. That's not how his church is operated and organized. So I want you to think how ridiculous this conversation is that's about to happen. I want you to listen to this. Jesus just described to them in detail that's a place they were about to enter. They were just think they were on the doorstep of entering into Jerusalem. He tells them, we, I am going to die. And James and John, their, their brothers, the sons of Zebedee, and Matthew includes their mom. So the mom's pushing them a little bit there. They hear, I'm going to die. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to beat me. I'm going to die. And the question that they have burning in their hearts is, hey, can we have the number one and number two position in the kingdom? I mean, we read, we read that, right? It's like, is, is this real? Did they re- is this, are, how dumb are they? How often has someone poured out their heart to us and their hurts to us? And they've barely closed their mouth till we start spitting out something stupid that has nothing to do with the hurt and the trauma they just shared with us. We go on to the, well, let me tell you about me, me, me now. We're not so unlike these disciples. They had in their mind, and to be fair, Jesus told them that they would operate on 12 thrones. Jesus said that. He, he put it out there, right? But wrong place, wrong time, right? They were worried about number one and number two position. And then what do you think that if, if, the, if you were a part of a group of 12, and you realized two people did the thing you've been wanting to do, but you didn't have the courage to do, which was ask for the number one and two spot, but they went ahead and asked and you didn't, how would you feel about that? You'd be super mad at them for asking. You'd be scared that they would get it. Then you'd be upset with yourself for not having the same boldness, wouldn't you? So there's just, there's anger and there's jealousy and there's bitterness. There's antagonism all around this situation. And this is what's crazy to me. Look, look at verse 35. This reminds me of what Pastor Hayden said, the rich young ruler. He comes up to Jesus and he says, good teacher. These disciples have seen Jesus walk on water. They've seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They've seen Jesus take a loaf, a couple loaves of bread, a couple of fish, and feed 10,000 plus people. They've seen him uh, bring demons out of people. They've seen him uh, give sight to the blind. They've seen him make the mute be able to speak. And yet they have the audacity just to call him teacher. And after he just referred to himself as the Son of Man, sometimes we're so blind to our own blindness, aren't we? We don't realize that sometimes Jesus is in the midst of our families and our lives, our households, and he's trying to do a work and he's trying to knock and he's trying to tell us something, but we're so worried about what we want, we don't have time for what Jesus desires. And they ask, verse 37, grant that we may sit on your right and on your left in glory. <sighs> mm. Boldness, isn't it? But listen to what Jesus says. He says, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. He says, are you able to drink this cup that I drink or be baptized in the baptism? Now, this is Old Testament language. This, this cup and this baptism, when you speak of cup or you speak of da- baptism, in the Old Testament and in that culture, it meant of impending doom was coming. And so he asked, are you able to drink the cup of pain that I'm going to drink? Are you able to be baptized in the painful baptism that I'm going to be baptized in? Man. They wanted to move from a servant 
to glory, but they forgot that the servant never graduates from being a servant, does he? It doesn't work like that. I fear there are many in the kingdom of God, in the church of God, in our church, that in your mind you've graduated from serving the church and serving Jesus. Oh, we'll pretty it up, won't we? I'm too busy. I got too much going on. You don't understand my situation. You don't know my life. Do we not think Jesus knows our situation yet still calls us to serve? Do we not believe the promise of God that when he says, I will be with you and guide you, no matter what our life circumstances is, do we not believe those? That when he calls us to come, to die, to go, to take up the cross, that, that he means to do all that in the midst of a busy life, in the midst of raising kids, in the midst of providing for a family, in the midst of inflation, in the midst of ridiculous election cycles, does he not mean to come and die and serve and give and do all those things in the midst of that life he has given us? Or does he qualify it every time he says, come and die? Or go and serve, or tell, or share, or give, or forgive, or practice kindness, or share grace, or love. Does he qualify those? You you do all those things except if you have this going on in your life. I don't believe Jesus makes such qualifications to you. I have yet to read one. So maybe for some of us here today, the call for us is that we've, we've followed Christ, but we don't serve Christ well. And for some of us, this is the excuse we use. And, and, and it, 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 Listen, you might have to put some steel-toed boots on for what I'm about to say. It's okay. Well, my, I got my old uncle from down in Mississippi. He, this is what he says. He says, we're about to shuck the corn from both ends. Some of us, if the church is truly the bride of Christ, if the church is truly the bride of Christ, aren't all those in that body meant to serve Jesus? Aren't they? But this is the excuse some of us will make. I do other things outside the church. I serve in other ways that you don't know about. I don't need to know about them. Jesus already knows. So the question is, in our minds and in our hearts, because God has given you a gift, and this, this is the thing. God has given everyone us a gift to serve His church. His church, His bride, the one He died for. He's given you a special gift that only He's given to you to serve in this body and only the way you can serve. And when you don't serve, you make us weaker. You make the body weaker. You make our impact weaker. We can't do stuff because you won't do stuff. You say, that's heavy. It's supposed to be. Because we never graduate from being a servant. None of us do. And maybe you have in your mind graduated from being a servant. Can I humbly and graciously call you back to your first love that is Jesus? That time where you were willing to give him everything and all at once. Could you recover that love and that passion for Jesus? Could you see what God can do with you? When all of us remember that all of us are servants. Because we see this, here in this. Look, we are, in, we are in a battle to either follow the model of the world or the model of the Lord. That's it. We have two models, the world's model and God's model. Look what he says in verse 41. Here in this, the ten, we said, begin to feel indignant to him. And Jesus says this. He says, look, among the Gentiles, among the people that are not my people, they act just like you're wanting to act. They model what you're wanting to model. 
You're wanting to model this hierarchy where there are no servants and that people are there to serve you. That's what the world does. The world tries to build itself up so it has more and more servants. And he absolutely says, he says, among you, this should not be this way. I love, look at verse 43. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't even a command. Look what, how he says it. He says, it is not this way among you. Just shut it down. Jesus says. And then he, because you know, they may ask the question, well, what do we do? If, if we're not following the only model we know, which is the, the model of the world, what model are we to follow? And I love that they probably ask that question. I love that you and I ask that question. Well, what model are we to follow? If I'm not following this model of the world, what am I supposed to do, Jesus? And he gives us an answer, doesn't he? Look what he says. Whoever wishes to become great shall be your servant. What? That sounds backwards, doesn't it? How, how does greatness... How, hold up, Jesus. I'm, I'm supposed to sweep floors and then I can become great? Because that's what a servant does. I'm, I'm supposed to wash feet? That's how I become great? Because that's what a servant does. Verse 44, and whoever wishes to be first... So be slave of all. A slave wouldn't even count it in a number. And you're, you're going from no number to being number one. Jesus, that math ain't mathing. See, we're in a battle, you and I, in our heart and in our mind. Because the reality is most of us, and because of the way life is, right? We're here for a certain amount of time. We come in this building. We have Sunday morning service. We have Sunday school. Some of you take advantage of D groups. If you haven't got into D group, I highly encourage you to find a D group. They're focused on Christ and relationship. John Myers and Heather Hergit uh, uh, operate those and run those respectively for our men's and women's group. And we have Sunday night service. We, we, we do Sunday night service. You say, well, I don't have time for Sunday night service. I'm begging you, make time because our children and our youth programs are exploding. We're seeing some amazing things happen in our reengaged marriage ministry. Our Bible study in the back, we go over this a little more. It's, it's blowing up. And you say, well, that's, that's not a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time in the day. But here's the reality. You and I spend more time in the world than we do in community together here. So why not maximize the time we spend together here so we can take the model that Jesus has given us here and we can apply it to the world and make a difference. Because what happens is, unintentionally for some of us, we're so into the world's model that we bring the world's model into the church. I, I, I've seen this a, a, lot of, a lot of times in, when we're doing stuff in the church, when business or finance, you have people that are business people in the world, and you, and you want them because they've got a good mind, they think about things. But the problem is sometimes we're really good business people in the church. They have good ideas, but sometimes it doesn't mix because you're trying to bring the world's model into God's kingdom, and it doesn't work like that. Right? So we've got to pick. Well, do we want to model the world and try to make servants and slaves for ourselves, or do we want to be the servants and slaves that are promised glory when Christ comes? And Jesus mentions he, in this passage, from his own example, he shows us, I'm going to go through these real quickly, five principles of a servant leader that Jesus models for us that we can then in turn model to others, Right? First one, we are to follow and learn from Jesus Christ. So Jesus models this because he's not learning from himself because he knows all, right? But he's following the will of the Father. So if you and I want to be a model servant that follows Jesus' model, we want to follow him and learn from him. So you and I, then we spend time in the Word of God on a regular basis. We spend time as much time as we can with the people of God so we can learn about the Son of God. Number two, we empower others. You say, what does it look like to empower others? I love that you asked that question. To empower others is to encourage them to discover their giftedness that God has given them and also encourage them to use the gifts God has given them. That's simply what it means to empower others. Number three, uh, uh, and that's what Jesus does. Number three, uh, he's self-aware. A, a model servant, a servant leader is self-aware. Jesus absolutely was self-aware. You say, well, how do, how do you know Jesus was self-aware? Do you not hear what he said? He says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. They're going to mock me. I know everything that's going to happen. I even know how dumb you are when you ask the question about what you're not supposed to ask. You're not paying attention to me. I get all of that. So if you want to be a good servant leader, it's good to be self-aware. You say, what does it mean to be self-aware? I'll give you a simple answer. That you know why 
you're making the statement or the decision you're making. That's a good reason. That's a good example. He said, what does it mean to be self-aware? I know why I'm making the decision I'm making. Simple. That's what Jesus, Jesus knows why he's making the decision he's making. Right? Number four, Jesus models for us. A servant leader builds community. They put people over projects. So Jesus absolutely has this in mind, right, this goal in mind. But what does he do? Does he, as the disciples, he's been with them three and a half years. Does he ever kick them out? Even Judas till the very end, knowing what he was going to do, did Jesus kick him out? No, he was trying to build community with his people. So many times, you and I, what we find ourselves in, we hurt relationships, is we put projects and goals over people and relationships. Jesus says, no, no. I value, John, I value this relationship a lot more than checking off some to-do list that I had done, right? Jesus says, I value you way much more than doing all this ministry business I have to do because I'm focused in on you right now. God's giving me you. So if we want to be a servant leader following the model of Jesus, be more concerned about people than projects. And the fifth thing Jesus shows us is this. We are to focus on the vision. Jesus never lost the vision of what he was called to do, did he? Ever. He never slipped from his mind of what he was put on this earth to do. And so for you and I, we have this vision. As a church, we have this vision. We want to impact our community. We want to reach uh, the schools. We want to reach young families. We want to reach the next generation here in DeSoto. That's our vision for this church. We want to transform DeSoto. We want to see a, 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 a Pentecostal-level revival here in our town. And we're praying for it. We're fasting for it. We're believing for it. Every day we work, every day we serve, we're believing that here for our town and our church. Like that's our vision. That's what God's given us. So if we want to be a servant leader, we want to follow these things that Christ has given us. And then he, he caps this off as I get ready to close. I, ooh, I'm so sorry. I'm looking at time. I apologize. I feel that. Last thing. Jesus has served us fully and completely by ransoming us from death and hell. So he tells them, I'm going to die. Then they get in an argument about being first. Then he tells them that's not going to be that way among you. The, 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 the slave shall be first. He says the servant, if you want to be great, you've got to serve. If you want to be first, you've got to be a slave. And he didn't just leave it there. So he puts this capstone statement that rounds out everything about this message. Listen to what he says in verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. He says, you want to know what I'm talking about? You watch me over the next week. You see me on the cross. Watch what I'm going to do. And this verse here is one of the most important verses you can ever hear in the Word of God. Jesus says, I'm going to be a ransom. What is a ransom? What is a ransom? Jesus has served us fully. Jesus has served us completely by ransoming us from death and from hell. What does that mean? We were prisoners. We couldn't get out. We were, we were dead and we couldn't make ourselves alive. The psalmist says we're in this miry pit that we can't get ourselves out of. We were, we were blind and could not see. We were lost and could not find our way. There was nothing we could do. And I, some of us need to hear this because this is gospel talk. Well, preachers don't preach like this a lot anymore. Without Christ, you are headed to a devil's hell for all eternity, and there is nothing you can do about it. Nothing. Nothing. You are locked in a prison of your own sin, and you cannot pay the ransom. You cannot escape the jail. You can't get out of the pit. You're never going to get your sight. You're never going to find your way. You're dead in your trespasses and sin. You're under the wrath of a holy and a righteous God. And there's nothing you can do to make yourself right. And if you die, if you take your last breath without Jesus, you will stand before him and experience the righteousness of his eternal wrath and perfect judgment on you. That's what is waiting for every single person who dies without Jesus. And you say, that's really harsh. Why would you say that to me? What do you think Jesus is talking about here? 
He doesn't say these words to make himself feel better. He, he just described everything he was going to endure, not for himself, but for you and me. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to beat me. They're going to kill me. And when they do that, my death upon a cross, bearing the wrath of a holy and righteous God, is going to pay the ransom for you so that you and me and any other person who does what Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells them, to believe in Christ, confess Him as Lord, believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from dead, and you shall be saved, that if a person does that, that they are ransomed for from hell they are brought into the eternal life and fellowship with God and there is nothing in heaven or hell or any other place that's ever been created can remove you from the fellowship of the Lord once Jesus has you so my question for you this morning as we get ready to close is this the first and most important question is this have you been ransomed from hell by surrendering your life to Jesus this morning and you could be six years old and you could be 96 years old You need to answer that question this morning. You need to answer that question. Have I been ransomed? Jesus says, I'm going to give my life for you. I'm going to pay it. Why would you willingly pay what Jesus has already paid? And the second question we have for you this morning is this. Are you living as a servant leader following the model Jesus has given. Because you may say, hey, I, I've given my life to Jesus. He's paid my ransom. And the question now is, am I following the model of the person who's laid down everything? So as our team comes this morning, as we ready ourselves, in, in just a few moments, we're gonna, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. I'm going to be out here, and Pastor Gene's going to be out here in our next step corner. Maybe you're here this morning, and you have a decision that you have to make this morning. That God has been getting all in your heart this morning. Beloved, do not leave here. Don't willingly leave this place, place paying the own, your own price for your sin when Jesus has already paid it. I'm going to pray, and after I pray, we're not going to sing just yet. Pastor Gene's going to come up. He's got uh, some business to take care of. But if you're here this morning, I'd love to talk to you. Pastor Gene would love to talk to you. Father God, thank you for the time you've given us this morning. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. God, I'm humbled that you would use somebody such as me to preach your word. I don't deserve the opportunity. I pray for your church right now, your church, this church, our family, that you would bind us to the cross, that you would help us to see how beautiful Jesus is, how majestic his sacrifice is, how purposeful it can be for our lives, and that not a person would leave here not being in relation with you. And I ask this for your glory. Amen.